like for all the NRIs to pick up their name, uh, their tent cards, and bring them to the back of the room to be helpful?
uh, hello. Uh, we ask you to be uh, a, uh, a bit more patient because we have uh, some technical issues with the slide and with a uh, remote participant. So in, in a few instants we shall uh, start. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. So hello everyone. Before we start, I'd like to thank you all for coming to our workshop, Game Over Before the Need of a PV6 for the Future of Games. And also, I would like to thank the panelists for accepting our invitation, and above all, I would like to thank Nick.br, CGI.br, and IGF for letting us discuss this problem here. Well, my name is Eduardo Barazal Morales, and I'm a computer engineer at the Brazilian Network Information Center, Nick.br a non-profit organization that tries to improve the internet quality in Brazil. And I'll be the moderator for this round table. For the online participation, Tiago Nakamura, also from Nick.br, will be the moderator. So let me introduce our panelists. Our round table is composed by Antonio Marcos Moreiras from Nick.br, who will represent the technical community. Then we have Lee Howard from Retivia, who will give an internet service provider's perspective. Up next, Klaus Nimenen from Ficora, who will give a governmental point of view. And then we have Barbara Simão from IDEC, who will bring the perspective of digital consumers' rights. And finally, Darren Veit our remote panelists from Microsoft Xbox, who will present a game company's perspective. So, let me show you how this workshop is organized. Our round table will start with a little introduction to the theme of the migration to IPv6, IPv4 address exhaustion, and online games. Then our panelists will have up to five minutes each to introduce themselves and their points of view about the problem. After that, we will have 15 minutes of open microphone, both for the audience and remote participants. Next, the panelists will have another five minutes to discuss solutions and possibilities for collaboration. And finally, we will have 15 more minutes for another open microphone. So let's start with the problem. In our country, Brazil, we have a lot of internet service providers, almost 6,000. In this year, many of them have reported us connectivity problems with online games. So 
our IPv6.br team decided to investigate this problem and we discovered that many online games don't use IPv6. And some of them haven't even started to plan this migration. Only mobile games are going in another direction because Apple makes them use IPv6. And we also discovered that most of the games requires good connectivity and some of them requires income connections. From the internet service provider's point of view, they are suffering from IPv4 exhaustion. In some regions like Latin America, ISP that are already in an autonomous system cannot receive any more IPv4 addresses. In other regions like North America, they can buy it, but it's too expensive. Because of that, they have started to use CGNet, which causes other problems, such as income connections, which CGNet doesn't allow, and the difficulty in finding the right proportion between clients and ports. So, as you may see, we have a problem here because online games companies only use IPv4 and the ISPs are suffering from IPv4 exhaustions. So, what's the best solution for this problem? The perfect solution is to deploy IPv6, which has many advantages. It's faster than IPv4, it allows end-to-end -end connectivity, and each user has their own public IPv6 address. All because it doesn't need any network address translator in the middle of the communication, like CGNet. However, to use IPv6, we need to both sites to deploy it, ISPs and online games because a machine with IPv6 will only talk directly to another machine that has IPv6, and a machine with IPv4 will only talk directly to another machine that has IPv4. That's a compatibility issue, that's, and that's why we need to improve IPv6 deployment. Why IPv6 is not widely deployed? We need to discover what problems there are with IPv4 and games. So that's why we have some questions here that I hope our panelists could discuss. First, do game companies use blacklists or any kind of a PV filter? Imagine how many clients might be affected if you filter the IPv4 address from the CGNet. Because if you do that, you be filtering the whole ASP. Second, how many ports should a client receive? We have heard that some online games use more than 1,000 ports. So if an ISP gives 2,000 ports to a single client, that number might not be enough for, for all web servers that his clients want to use. Third, do online, games, do online games usually require incoming connections? And fourth, how worse is a double net connection? So now we are going to hear our specialists talk about this problem. So we will start with Antonio Marcos Moreiras. Thank you, Eduardo. Very well. I'm Antonio Moreiras. I'm a projects and development manager at Nick.br. As Eduardo already said, uh, uh, Nick.br is a private organization, not for profit, related to the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. We manage the .br domain names, that's where our funding comes from. I'm a computer engineer, master in computer engineering, and I've been working with IPv6 dissemination in Brazil for the last 10 years. Next slide, please. Oh, it's here. Okay. Very well. Uh, some ISPs have approached me and my team at Nick.br and uh, asked our, our help 
regarding one problem that was bothering them a lot. Their customers were complaining about the gaming online or more precisely about not being able to play online. These ISPs were using CGNAT for sharing IPv4. They were also using IPv6. Both, but some game platforms seem to have problems with both technologies. So we started to dig in these issues and, we, and to try to help them. It seems that uh, it's not a problem unique to Brazil. Maybe it's more evident uh, for us because our market for internet is growing, is growing very fast. There are a lot of new small ISPs in Brazil. They have to share IPv4 addresses. In some way, they have no real choice about it. Nor it is a problem unique to game platforms. Uh, we know that similar situations could come to smart TVs, security cameras, and other kind of home appliances and internet applications in general. I would like to give some data about ISPs in Brazil that you see in the slide. Brazil is a very big country, geographically I mean, uh, with more than 5,500 cities, municipalities. Less than 10% of these cities are attended by the incumbents, by the major internet providers. So we have more than 6,000 autonomous systems and we have more than 7,000 ISPs. Some uh, of these ISPs are very small. We call them regional ISPs. 70% of these ISPs have less than 1,000 subscribers. Uh, sometimes some of these uh, regional ISPs uh, lack technical knowledge. And sometimes this can be part of the problem. So I'm not here just to, to blame the game platforms. Part of the problem can be of ISPs sometimes. We conducted a small survey in the last two weeks asking the ISPs a series of questions about issues with games. Uh, we had 172 answers, 172 ISPs answered the answering the survey. 90.2% uh, of them say that this issue is a relevant problem for their business. And a bit more than half of them are already delivering IPv6 to their users. But what is the issue anyway? Very well. Uh, the internet infrastructure nowadays is working based in paper clip and hot glue, okay? It is dependent of a big, very big workaround, that is CGNAT. We don't have more IPv4 address. It's impossible, or at least not viable, for the majority of ISPs to provide public IPv4 address for home users. They are sharing IPv4 addresses using normally what we call carrier-grade NAT or CGNAT. They are also using IPv6. When we have a problem, we have a problem if, first, the game platform or the application platform in general does not support CGNAT. For instance, if it needs incoming connections or if it cannot recognize two different user sessions coming from the same IPv4 address, or if it have uh, poor criteria blacklisting IPv4 addresses used in NAT pool of the ISP. Two, second situation when we have a problem if the game platform lack uh, also IPv6 support. And the third situation, 
if IISP, if the IISP has a broken IPv6 implementation or if the IISP has a broken CGNAT implementation. It is our understanding that all these three situations are happening, happening simultaneously. Uh, very well. Most of the complaints are about Sony PlayStation or PSN, but we also have complaints about other platforms such as Xbox that do have IPv6 support, uh, League of Legends, Tibia, Cabal. We invited Sony to this workshop, but they declined, explaining that they could not discuss publicly the roadmap of future, fu future technologies. Uh, it seems that they were talking about IPv6 when they told future technology. Maybe it can be their future, but uh, it's a present technology for at least, at least one in each four internet users in Brazil. And this number is growing fastly. Sony is answering Brazilian, Brazilian user complaints by email saying, uh, I will read it, the words could not be exact because I, I, I translated it from pro Portuguese to English, uh, and we received the, the, the same response from some different source. So, so Sony is saying, PlayStation is not yet compatible with IPv6, however, your internet provider must offer IPv4 address if you request them, or they should offer a platform that uses IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. In Brazil, only 80% of internet providers are using IPv6, so PlayStation is not yet using IPv6. In the US, only 25%, and here we still do not use IPv6. All internet providers have until the year of 2020 to switch from IPv4 to IPv6. Very well. I have no idea where they get this magical, magical date of 2020. Seeing by the point of view of ISPs, this is very, very bad, this answer, I mean, because they are doing the ISPs are doing the best they can, they are delivering IPv6, they are doing CGNAT the best way they know, and the game platform says to their customer that they are to blame, that they, are, they have to take new IPv4 address from some magical hat until 2020. So, that's it, that's the, the problem, in my, my point of view, please. Thank you, Moreiras. So let's continue with Lee Howard. That, hi, my name is Lee Howard. That last quote was really just shocking and, and wrong. 50% of the US has IPv6, according to Facebook and, and Akamai, I believe. And Google is about, says 45%, I think. 25% 25% is worldwide. Yeah, worldwide, in, and in Brazil, almost 30%. So, uh, my name is Lee Howard. Um, I have a small company um, working on making a larger company that does IPv4, IPv6 translation. We also do some consulting and training. But really, sort of why I got involved in IPv6 is I was responsible for the IPv6 deployment for one of the world's largest IPv6 networks. And, um, and based on that, I was also then a working group co-chair at uh, the V6 Ops Working Group uh, for IPv6 operations at the IETF. When we started deploying IPv6, management, of course, said we must not provide a bad user experience. We need to measure how this is affecting how people are using the internet. So in particular, we did a lot of performance testing. Um, Comcast, for instance, uh, provided a speed test where you could compare the, the download speed and the latency uh, over IPv4 and IPv6. And this is a screenshot from 2014 showing that they're actually getting higher throughput, 17 megabits per second, over uh, IPv6 compared to 14 over IPv4. Uh, APNIC did some measurements, just comparing the round trip time uh, over IPv4 and IPv6. And in 20, what was that, 2012, 
they found that IPv4 was generally, was, was slightly more often a little bit faster than IPv6. And in 2013, IPv6 was a little bit faster. And that has seemed to be, continued to be the, the case. And I'm going to keep providing, since people always say, no, it can't really be faster, I wanted to show there are lots of different measurements showing, showing what's going on. Uh, Cable Labs did some studies saying, well, let's see, is there a difference between IPv4 and IPv6 uh, performance in the lab? And they found, yes, actually IPv6 is in the mean and the median a little bit faster. Interestingly, they also tested two layers of network address translations. So one at the home and then one at uh, a, a carrier grade uh, net address translator. And IPv4 got faster when it went through two layers of NAT. They obviously, no explanation for that whatsoever. That was bizarre. Um, Cisco did uh, tests similar to uh, Jeff Houston's tests, showing uh, that um, there's a slight prefs, you know, slightly more often IPv6 is slightly faster. Uh, this was mine. Uh, we did some testing. I put probes into uh, 10 different hubs around the country, and I just did a, a TCP round trip uh, uh, test to uh, something like the top 10 or 12 websites and counted the measurements. Anything in green, IPv6 was, 20, was more than 20% faster than IPv4. Anything in pink, IPv4 was more than 20% faster than IPv6. And what you can sort of the trends you can see is that in general, either a website is faster or slower over one protocol, or in general, one of our hubs, the columns are our hubs or one of our hubs was generally, in some cases, uh, slower over IPv6. Well, so it turns out that routing matters, and when you do traffic engineering and you move, there's congestion someplace in the network and you move traffic around so that you can relieve that congestion, it turns out sometimes <laughs> the engineers don't remember to move both IPv4 and IPv6 traffic, and therefore uh, one protocol family ends up being uh, happier than the other. Those tend nor to normalize. Uh, academia has also done uh, some research into IPv6. Uh, in this one, uh, it's a little hard to see here, but um, most of the time, uh, uh, most, tra most, most of the top websites were faster over IPv6, and actually a very high percentile um, was, at, was within one millisecond or, or faster. Uh, and uh, the happy eyeballs timer of 150 milliseconds actually gives you um, a really nice sort of performance measurement. Uh, Apple later did some testing that showed, I think they, they saw that 90 milliseconds was a sweet spot. Um, Akamai did some, uh, some measurements. They found that in the median, IPv6, the, the selected websites were, uh, now to be fair, they tested, in, for this particular uh, test, they tested one device on one mobile network in the US because that's where they had the best instrumentation. And they found that in general, IPv6 was five, was, was in, sorry, in median, IPv6 was 5% faster. And in the 19th, 95th percentile, it was 15% it was faster. So there's uh, consistent reporting that IPv6 is just, is just a few milliseconds faster. Uh, this was a, uh, a, a more scholarly paper that they did. The, uh, the dark line is the IPv6 page load time, and the dotted line is the IPv4 page load time. And what's hard to see here, because you know there's only so many ways that you can in put graphics on a slide, but the dark line is to the left in every case. And so the scale shows that generally, just for web page load time, we see one or two seconds of, diff of, of faster speed for downloading websites. Now, if you have, if you maintain a website and you can make it down, and you can get it to download a second or two faster, you know that's money. Uh, Facebook has done similar kinds of performance. Um, they saw um, IPv6 being 30 to 40 percent faster. They've kind of backed off of this in later studies. They said uh, there is evidence that there is a statistically significant advantage over IPv6, but they're not no longer willing to, to necessarily stand by the 30 to 40 percent statement. But I don't have a graphic for that. And uh, LinkedIn provided some measurements over a bunch of different networks in several different countries. Uh, and so this is the percentage faster that a web page downloaded on various different networks. So these were US networks, and it goes from uh, about 2% faster to 20% faster. The UK was, uh, what's that, 
12, 15, 20% faster. Uh, Germany, significantly faster. Uh, since we're in France, I thought you'd be in particular interested that it was 17% uh, to 40% faster over IPv6 in France, depending on which network you're on. A pretty incredible difference there. If you can, if you can improve your speed by 40%, that's uh, something everybody's interested in, and especially gamers. And so um, I guess the, the one more most recent and ongoing measurement we see is from Jeff Houston at APNIC, where he's doing side-by-side -side measurements using ad networks, and he shows uh, that there's a, a significant difference, sort of depending on which region you're in, uh, how significant it is, and of course it varies significantly by, by network too. And so um, something that it's hard to see in most of these slides is, but I'm sure they're online available later. I have included the source for every slide down at the bottom, but in many slides it was covered by the uh, transcription. Uh, so you can download the slides, find the sources yourself. And you can also go test speed for yourself, and you can test whether IPv6 is faster than IPv4. Of course, you can't do that now because the IGF network doesn't have IPv6. That's it, thank you. So thank you, Lee Howard. Let's continue with Klaus Niemenem. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Klaus Niemenem from Finnish Communications Regulatory Authority and FICORA, and I've been chairing the National IPv6 Working Group for some years. Uh, well, first I had to ask for myself that, uh, do we actually care gaming? I mean, the gaming isn't really our top priority, but I think it's a pretty good example of internet applications that can benefit from IPv6. So, then I'm actually going to the story that why do we actually care about the IPv6? We believe that the IPv6 actually offers better an internet for end users, mainly because of the reachability and end-to-end -end connectivity. Um, I mean that the, according to the European TSM regulation, for example, the, the end users are able to uh, use and provide information services, application, and content. And basically, if you are behind uh, NAT, it's much harder for yourself to actually start providing services and applications. So we have some legal background also to this topic. However, I mean, we are not watching the topic from the uh, regulatory perspective mainly. It's, we are trying to get the better services uh, by, by having a collaboration and cooperation with the industry, not mandating them to, for example, implement IPv6. We had this discussion um, nearly 10 years ago, and we decided against uh, regulating the ISPs to implement uh, IPv6. Uh, I, I will tell later about the, the, what we did, but, um, well, we actually believe that the IPv6 is essential of course, because the addresses are running out. It's not that direct need in Finland because we have a, well, quite a legacy um, ISPs and, and mainly, I would say, quite much of the IPv4 addresses. So we are not really running out of the IP addresses in, in Finland, of course, um, partly due to the fact that the mobile networks are using carrier-grade NATs. And then again, the, the carrier-grade NATs uh, causes some problems. And, and basically we believe that the, the, the having the, the different NAT devices in between actually harms the, the, the end user's possibility to use and provide services. And that's the reason why we are interested in the topic. We believe that the, the intent connectivity, um, well, the reachability is much better and as, as we actually saw from the last presentation, also the, the end user experience from the quality wise would be much better. And basically, if I'm thinking a bit further about the problem, because this was really the, about the problem statement, uh, well, we had also figures from uh, Google that the latency for IPv6 is actually quite much um, lower than for IPv4. 
And um, I would say that this is a really good um, benefit for the use of software IPv6. We also believe that the, the IPv4 well, with the NAT provides a lot of problems for the content providers. First of all, they can't use the IP address to identify users, and it makes the implementation much more complex. Let's think about the, the, the voice applications. The basic idea was to have a simple protocol, simple tools to build applications, but then you have to implement different type of the net traversal techniques that makes, makes it uh, much harder and more, more complex for the, the application providers and content providers. So it actually also harms the, the, the um, internet being the engine of innovation in this sense. It's not me, I would say that it's not maybe the major problem, but it's all one of the factors that may impact. And then about the, the real problem statement, because uh, we've been talking about IPv6 for long. I mean, my, my university teacher was teaching in late 90s that IPv6 will come in a few years. And it took a bit longer. Uh, well, he didn't actually need to change the slides for 10 years or <laughs> something like that. And, and basically, the problem is that we don't really have a deadline for the implementation of IPv6. Uh, and we don't really have a, a clear return of investment. Let's say we have the ISPs or some companies or the experts who claim that now we have to take a stand and, and implement IPv6. It requires resources, it requires some, some work and money. And then you talk your management that basically how we are going to get the money back. Well, we can always put that bit later because there's um, something in the roadmap uh, map that actually gives you money back. And, and I think that's one of the, the main problems. Everybody knows that they have to implement IPv6 someday. But, uh, well, then that day is going to come. That, that has been the question. Now I think we are in much better situation than a few years ago, because IPv6 is already mainstream. It's not a niche that you can say that only a few companies have implemented it. However, I mean, we are still lacking the social pressure, market pressure in many, many markets. The gaming market could be one, some, some national markets could be the case. You have the markets, let's say, now in Finland or in, well, I think in many European countries, US, the, the penetration is already pretty good. So you have the pressure there, but, um, well, globally, we have still work to be done. And, um, well, also, I would, say I would like to address the security, because I have heard security many times as an excuse or a real problem why the, the companies, they are not going to implement IPv6. Of course, it's part of the, the, the lack of maybe education, lack of resources, lack of, uh, let's say, infrastructure replacements, but also it could be also an excuse that because of the security, we're not going to touch the topic at all. And um, that's a shame, I would say. But now, my message at least is that uh, IPv6 is mainstream. It's really widely implemented. And it's now time to uh, look at the topic. Yeah. So thanks, Klaus. Let's continue with Barbara. Um, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm Barbara Simon, and I work at EDAC, which is a civil society organization in Brazil that deals with consumer defense, mainly, claim, mainly claiming for justice and balance, balance within consumer relations. EDAC works with different uh, themes, such as health and food, but my team there we works with um, specifically with telecom and digital rights, and our mission in general is to improve network access and quality for the Brazilian customers. Uh, well, the theme, we're, the theme we're discussing here today has a lot to do with quality of access. People are not being able to profit 100% from the internet they hired 
due to problems with the tr transition from IPv4 to IPv6. When IDEC was invited by Nick Biar to talk about this problem about a month ago in Brazil, we did a small research on a Brazilian official database of consumers' complaints. Then we discovered a few interesting things. Um, since last year, 20, 28 complaints were fined. And that's not at a first view a large number, but that's the not, that, this does not mean that the problem is of a small pro proportion. Um, these complaints were able to show us some particularities of this problem that are really interesting. Uh, first, the complaints there demonstrated a lot of technical expertise on the topic. People who wrote there already knew how the problem should be solved by the ISPs, also describing resolutions from a working group of Anatel, which is the um, telecom regulator in Brazil, and that should work as a solution for this problem, at least a temporary solution. And the resolution, just to explain for you, is uh, say that any consumer that has problems, that have problems with a shared IPv4, the, the IPv4 with the NAT, uh, has the right to demand for the ISP to change it for a public IPv4. Um, so um, this shows that consumers who complain on the official databases already know what's happening and how the ISPs or the game providers could fix it. But when we look at a global picture, the scenario is not that, sim that simple. As I as already said here before, um, this problem does not affect only gamers, but also people who use surveillance cameras, VPNs, smart TVs, etc. And most consumers does, does, do not have the technical knowledge to fully understand what's wrong and to properly complain. They, they mainly think there's a problem with the project and not with the connection involved. So I think one main problem for, from a consumer perspective is this structural barrier of knowledge that can make consumers give up to complain when they simply don't understand what's happening. Um, they, this, should be, this should be minimized by the company's customer service. But the majority of consumers who complained also mentioned that they achieved no, no success on talking to those responsible for the service. The attendants were not prepared to explain or to present any kind of solution. So I imagine the number of people that just give up when the situation is so difficult like that. And just concluding, I think the problem for consumers in general is mainly of information and proper means to find a resolution for their problems. Um, information regarding any aspects that may impact the quality of a service should be well provided by the companies responsible. Because this is, as I, I said before, a um, um, problem with the quality of access they are having and they should be informed of that. And I think that's it. Thank you, Barbara. So, Let's hear our remote participant, Darren Vaid. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Darren Vaid. I work in Xbox in the multiplayer networking platform. And so our team is responsible for providing uh, game companies with network connectivity for their games running on Xbox. Um, thanks everybody for presenting. There's been some really inf uh, interesting information presented so far. Um, I can say from an Xbox perspective, when we look at uh, consoles that are doing online games, that we're actually seeing close to 50% worldwide for IPv6 connectivity. Um, it's been trending up year over year, uh, and we do see uh, bumps here and there with uh, large ISPs rolling out IPv6 uh, connectivity. Uh, to talk about the CGNAT problem, so CGNAT is definitely an issue that we're aware of. Uh, we've been aware of it since uh, the previous generation with Xbox 360. Um, and when we originally were designing Xbox One, we knew that we needed to be able to address uh, connectivity issues uh, when we started seeing uh, larger ISPs starting to roll out CGNAT. Uh, to take it a step back further is that uh, there 
are two classifications of games. You have some games that are client server based and then you have games that are peer to peer. Uh, it's primarily the peer to peer games uh, where we see issues with CGNAT that can cause problems with peer to peer connectivity. Uh, so uh, back in uh, almost two years ago, uh, there's an application on Xbox called Party Chat, which is a uh, means of communicating with other players within the same game or even across games. Uh, its architecture defaulted to a peer-to-peer, -peer, and back in late uh, 2016, we actually enabled IPv6 connectivity for that application. Uh, and then there's also the default platform uh, for games doing peer-to-peer uh, -peer connectivity on Xbox. And we also enabled uh, IPv6 connectivity uh, for that platform uh, a little over a year ago. There was some interesting data that when we started taking a look at this uh, to see uh, how many connections were actually running over IPv4. Uh, and we saw that there was a, uh, and you can see in the slide diagram, a uh, bit of a, a funneling activity, uh, funneling, funneling behavior when we started seeing uh, what it takes to actually connect two consoles peer to peer over IPv6. Uh, so once again, starting at uh, a little under 50% of consoles with IPv6 connectivity, when we actually try to connect two players, uh, we need to have IPv6 on both ends of the connection. And so, that drops down your base down to, you know, roughly has a 50% filtering effect. Uh, we also use IPsec for uh, network security. And so it's uh, native IPsec using uh, internet key exchange and ESP packet protocol. Uh, one of the challenges we run into there is that uh, many uh, home routers, whether they're uh, consumer purchased or uh, provided by their ISP, uh, don't follow the guidance of RFC 6092 and actually block uh, either uh, Ike and or ESP protocols. And so uh, we're not able to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection using IPsec. Uh, we've actually been working with uh, uh, ISPs and router manufacturers to address that issue. Uh, and then finally, if you have uh, IPv6 on both ends, uh, you're able to traverse the IPv6 well, then you also need to have an uh, instance where the IP path latency is less or equal than IPv4. We do give a slight preference to IPv6 um, where we will uh, start the connection uh, process for IPv6 before IPv4, but ultimately it's the whichever path uh, connects first and is able to establish bidirectional connectivity uh, is the path that we use for the session. Um, so going back to the uh, CGNAT and peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, as well as client-server, uh, from a consumer standpoint, the client-server uh, typically isn't uh, something that uh, becomes problematic uh, just because NATs typically don't come into play when you're talking about client-server applications. Uh, but even then, it's... Uh, there's there's a bit of a mix when when I take when I take a look at different game titles, uh, there's often a uh, uh, multifaceted approach to connectivity even within game modes. I can give an example of one of our own titles, uh, Gears of War Four, uh, for the online competitive and uh, cooperative modes, uh, Horde mode. Uh, those are all uh, hosted within Microsoft Azure. They're uh, client server based, and so uh, uh, incompatible NAT types doesn't come into play. However, there's also a online campaign co-op, uh, which is hosted by one of the uh, peer machines when you're joining a game session together. And so uh, NAT types do come into play there. And that's where we have been able to leverage IPv6 uh, to help uh, address instances where the V4 NAT types are incompatible. Um, so yeah, going back, CGNAT is something that we're definitely aware of. Uh, it has gone from uh, an issue that can be present where we were mostly seeing it within small to medium uh, network operators to now we're seeing uh, larger ISPs rolling it out because of IPv4 address exhaustion. Uh, we've also taken steps uh, because of double NATs 
uh, often being a, a cause of peer-to-peer -peer connection problems. Uh, the Xbox console will now actually alert the customer to the presence of a double NAT if uh, incompatible or a challenging NAT type is detected. And we also detect that there's a double NAT present that will actually display that to the customer within the network settings uh, because it is a, a common pain point for customers. Um, and then also uh, we took some steps to change the network settings uh, to also inform the customer that if uh, we only detect IPv4 to uh, give them some information about IPv6 uh, to help them help educate as far as the, you know, that there are benefits to having IPv6. It's, it's not uncommon uh, in some markets that uh, even if the customer has IPv6 available from their ISP, that they may have uh, home networking equipment that has it turned off by default, uh, that they need to take some additional steps to enable that. Um, and when it comes to, uh, to kind of wrap up a little bit, uh, when we talk about uh, IPv6 and gaming, it's definitely when you talk about the the peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, it's an interesting uh, consumer problem that is fairly unique. Uh, when we talk about the pain points of V4 address exhaustion and, and IPv6 benefits, typically it's done from a operator perspective that um, that we're concerned with uh, the monetary cost of trying to allocate V4 addresses for people connecting to servers. But when you look at gaming, it's a unique or fairly unique uh, scenario where the customer can actually see benefit from IPv6 and it helps can help justify uh, network operators that want to further invest in IPv6 to actually have customers that are interested in it uh, as long as we provide them with that information to show them that uh, why uh, it's helpful in these scenarios. That's all, Daring? Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, we don't have much time, so let's move on to the second part where we discuss solutions and possibilities for collaboration, and then we will have the open microphone session, okay? So, Antonio, go on. Um, well, so, what we have to do to go towards a solution? First of all, we should remember that ISPs and game platforms have the, the same customers, at, le at least in this situation, in this context. So we have a, we, ISPs and game platforms have a common problem and why not to look for a solution together? Uh, I, I, I really don't understand why it's uh, being so difficult to uh, put together uh, the game platforms and the ISPs to to talk about uh, a solution in this in this problem. Uh, the the second idea to to remember is that uh, IPv6 is the current internet protocol. All the effort in the internet standards at the IETF and the internet engineering at ISPs are being done considering IPv6. IPv4 is still there, is still the most used protocol, but it is legacy. And how to work together? What we have to do? Well, I think we have to share information. First, regarding IPv6 implement implementation, what's the real status for the ISPs, for the, the game platforms, what the, what's the planning, what's the schedule to do it, and what are the difficulties, uh, how can we do it? And second, 
sharing information about CGNet, about shared IPv4, how ISPs are doing it, how game platforms are supporting it, how IPv4 is being shared by ISPs, how many subscribers by public IPv4, uh, what should be a best practice regarding this, how many open ports a game platform needs simu simultaneously? Uh, does it depend on the on the title, on the on the on the title, on the game being played, or, or is it uh, a characteristic of the platform? I don't know it. Uh, do the platform or do the the, the games uh, need in common connections? Uh, what should be the best practice on this? What are the criteria for a, a game platform to insert an IPv4 address in a blacklist? It's one of the common complaints of the ISPs. How to avoid this? How to avoid IPv4 to be inserted in a blacklist? And how to delete it from the blacklist? Well, uh, Again, I have serious difficulties to understand why it's been so difficult to get ISPs and game platforms to talk at least in a technical level so we could easily improve the situation. Uh, it would be very good uh, to hear uh, from Darin Veda a perspective on, on this, on, on the, of the game platforms, if you can in your time. And if you can't get all the parts to cooperate, maybe we need some kind of enforcement, right? I don't like uh, the, the idea of, of enforcement. I don't uh, think it's really needed. Uh, but uh, I have to, to ask, and uh, it's one of the reasons uh, we, we bring this problem to the IGF. Uh, to put more people and more perspectives on the table and ask what could governments and regulatory agencies do? Uh, what could civil society groups aimed to defend user rights do? Well, at least, uh, at least uh, maybe governments and uh, regulatory agencies and civil societies, uh, civil society groups uh, defensors of user rights could help us to invite the game platforms and the ISPs to the same table to discuss, to discuss technically the question because it's something that the, the technical community and the ISPs uh, uh, are not uh, succeeding. So, so uh, we, we, we can't do it, at least alone. That's it. Thank you, moderators. Lee Howard can continue. I think I mostly want to respond to Antonio's questions. I, I did really like what Barbara said earlier about civil society um, uh, noticing, uh, not civil society, sorry, the regulator noticing that there are, that there is a consumer impact. Um, but we saw the panel this morning on uh, how regulators can influence IPv6, and, and generally um, the consensus there seemed to be that convening meetings between stakeholders was a more effective uh, practice than actually providing any regulation. When I've studied governments that have a regulation around IPv6, regulating private companies to use IPv6, those tend to be the countries with the least IPv6 deployment. Um, there's now, but in, in, in the case that I think Barbara uh, had, dis had described, where a, a consumer can request a dedicated IP, their own IPv4 address, if a, consumer has, if a customer has to call the ISP and ask for an IPv4 address, that customer is no longer profitable because you've had to spend the money to answer the phone and you've had to give them an address that costs $20. And so that's at probably at least one year of the profit for that customer. So that's really the worst scenario for an ISP is to, you know, is to lose money on customers. 
Uh, and, but then, you know, the, on the other hand, you were talking about blacklisting. If uh, something that we see in, um, in the gaming community is uh, you start to lose to, to somebody, to, to another player, um, people will actually go out and pay for denial of service attacks against the IP address of a rival player. If that IP address is a shared IPv4 address behind a carrier grade NAT, they may actually be attacking 50 or 100 or 1,000 users rather than just the one player who, who offended them. So there's even, you know, e even worse cases for, uh, for the use of, of carrier grade NAT. Uh, what do we do about it? I do think, I, I think that more convening like this is, is useful to show that there are issues here, but I'm also very interested to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you, Lee. Can you continue? Klaus? Okay, as I mentioned before, we were discussing before regulating the IPv6, so for enforcing the, the uh, ISPs to implement it, and, and basically we decided against it. We didn't see that really a good, good choice. And then, well, what we did, uh, well, first we published a recommendation for ISPs to implement IPv6 regarding the, the technical implementation like the prefix size, the lifetime, um, or the, the, the do not block uh, the, the extensions. So basically try to make the, the IPv6 working because we know that if you make a broken implementation, you, you face problems. And well, but that wasn't really the major a major task. Uh, we, we actually decided to launch the national IPv6 launch in 2015. And before that, we had basically 0% uh, coverage for IPv6. We managed to get um, eight ISPs on board. Uh, all major ISPs joined. We managed to get 16 caps joining the initiative basically also including free hosting providers, so the, the coverage was actually much larger. We got our top web, websites joining. Uh, National Broadcast had some problems with the, the publishing systems and quite a complex uh, background systems, so they're not fully IPv6 yet. But uh, as you can see, we managed to get um, more than five million subscriptions IPv6 enabled in one day. And that's basically one subscription per capita in Finland. So we got a pretty good coverage. But as you can see, that maps still just to the 7% the of the utilization because of the, even though the ISP switches IPv6 on, it doesn't mean that everybody actually start using it. There, are of, there were, of course, still are uh, terminal equipment dependent issues, the software dependent issues, or the service dependent issues. So that's the reason why, why not everybody is using IPv6 yet. But I mean, it's a continuous process, and we are improving all the time. Basically, I know that few other companies have uh, uh, enabled IPv6, but now we are seeing um, coverage more than 20%. So basically, the, the, the rate is increasing all the time. And, and basically, I believe the most important thing that we managed to build this kind of the, the social pressure and get companies to actually implement it. Uh, without the, this kind of the launch date that we had a deadline, I would assume that uh, it would have been taken much longer to get IPv6 ongoing. But because we had the, the we could advertise that the national broadcast is on, your main competitor is on, then it's much easier to ask from the player that why you are not. I mean, basically that really helped to convince the, the management of those companies to do it. So that was my reason to emphasize the, the really the, the, the social and, and peer pressure, basically to get the, the, the management of the companies to understand the importance. And we also, of course, were giving a lot of free advertisement and goodwill. So that also helps. And of course, well, I mean, 
we are really talking about the, the connectivity issues, the, we are talking about uh, how to enable end, end users to connect, connect each other. And basically, the other thing what we did was really already discussed here by Barbara. So we actually told the ISPs to give the, the end users a public IPv4 address, then they are requesting it. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be that you call your assistance. You may do it from the portal by yourself. So you don't necessarily need to have a human contact there. But anyway, I mean, it's up to the ISP to arrange how they do it. And um, we believe that, uh, of course, this kind of the public address, it helps really on the connectivity side. And because the, the IPv6 isn't yet dominant, I mean, the, we have IPv6 in many networks. They, they are enabled in many devices. But still, there are a lot of applications that doesn't support IPv6. And that was the reason why we actually decided that at this point of the time, it's still adequate to require public IPv4. But I'm pretty confident that this, this um, requirement would change, change then the, the IPv6 becomes dominant because uh, we really need to have not only public IPv address, but we need to have a common protocol. Basically, you need to talk with IPv4 to another party talking IPv4 or IPv6, both of them. But we don't want to have a translations in between. It doesn't really help. So basically, yeah, my message is that uh, try to build momentum. Try to get, let's say, the, the certain let's say game companies or the, the nationally certain framework to actually do it. Define a, a deadline and then you actually in a nice process. And, and of course, as a regulatory authority, we could also impose requirements, but we don't really see them that important compared to the, the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, can you continue? Um, so, um, for me, it's um, kind of difficult to come up with a technical solution since I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> but I think um, we are in a transition moment and what works in transi transition moments is dialogue and cooperation between all the parts involved. And <clears throat> one idea I had if, is if um, channels of customer service could be created to, for, this, for this particular issue. I mean, I don't know, uh, specific training uh, of the responsibles in the ISP, ISP, ISP companies or the game for providers uh, that could properly indicate for the customer what's wrong and then what should he do to, to, to solve the problem. And <clears throat> the customers, as already said here, are the same for the ISPs and for the game providers. And so this is kind of a shared responsibility between, between them. And they should cooperate for this to work. And as if what so civil, society could, civil society could do, we can pressure the regulators, we can do information campaigns, um, but that's mainly what we can do, but the, the responsibility is still, is still of the, the companies that provide the service. And that should, that should um, be, be resolved and customers would be, um, could pr so that customers could, could provide of 100% of the, the internet they hired. Thank you, Barbara. So, Daring, can you hear us? Daring? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me okay? So, can you continue? Yeah, so, um, uh, just looking at the policy questions. Uh, so, there's already a forcing function for uh, gaming platforms that use client server uh, based apologies that um, we're well aware of the impact that it has to try to provide additional IPv4 addresses for uh, clients connecting. And so 
that'll be a uh, natural forcing function for client server based games to uh, start working towards more IPv6 implementation uh, from Microsoft side. Uh, there's, we've made uh, a good amount of progress, but there's still a lot more progress to bring all of our services and games to be able uh, to connect over IPv6 from a client server topology. Um, as far as the issues that we'll face with IPv6 uh, not deploying, so I, I would actually, I would add a, a qualifier. I would say it's more than just IPv6 being available. I would say that uh, high quality, low latency IPv6, um, that's one of the big things that you look at for games is that uh, multiplayer gamers are very latency sensitive. And so uh, we've actually done some of our own testing with a lot of uh, in-home uh, routers uh, a couple of years back. and. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to see uh, in-home network devices that with IPv6 would actually perform worse uh, for IPv6 when it came to latency or throughput versus IPv4. Um, we've even seen this sometimes in the case of uh, enterprise uh, networking equipment that uh, the IPv4 paths and uh, connectivity were optimized, but IPv6 uh, was more of a, hey, it's a feature, uh, but it may perform uh, worse because uh, not many people have been paying too close attention to what those paths look like, uh, except for, you know, folks here on the panel and, and folks that are deeply embedded in this. Um, so, yeah, because of the problems that we have with CGNAT, uh, if uh, we don't see continued progress in uh, uh, connectivity and low latency, uh, that, that's something that uh, will become a, a, a even more growing problem as far as uh, gamers being connect. Uh, one thing I neglected to mention uh, as far as connecting peer to peer. Uh, so there's two primary methods that we uh, can use to work around uh, IPv4 NAT issues uh, that can be uh, increased in CG NAT environments. One is the IPv6 path, and another method is using uh, relay servers in order to work around incompatible NAT types. We've actually provided uh, game developers of the platform that uh, has automatic uh, fallback to using relay servers to work around uh, NAT problems. But I wouldn't say that that is a cure-all solution uh, because in doing so, it's not uncommon that you're also going to increase latency. Uh, take for instance, a fighting game where it's two people in the same game and they may be within the same region and if they're able to connect directly to each other, uh, they'll have an optimal experience from a latency perspective, but if they can't connect natively over IPv4 or IPv6, then if I have to uh, connect them via a relay in a cloud service like Azure or AWS, uh, now I could actually be increasing the latency in order to work around those problems. Um, overall challenges for v6 deployment, uh, I would say that it's still probably, uh, when I talked about uh, routers that don't have IPv6 enabled by default. It's something that uh, it's not uncommon. Uh, we've been working with router manufacturers for a while and that's just the, the step of having IPv6 enabled by default. Then there's that additional step of, hey, uh, is your IPv6 performance uh, as good or better than IPv, uh, excuse me, IPv6 performance as good or better than IPv4? Uh, and if not, there's additional work to be uh, done in that space to make multiplayer gaming more viable over IPv6. Uh, and then there was an earlier question about uh, blacklisting, uh, especially with CGNAT. There's definitely, I've, I've seen some of those problems in the community uh, that uh, folks may be unaware of CGNAT and the implications that it has. Uh, if you have methods of uh, blacklisting, uh, uh, that don't take into account that it's not a one-to-one -one mapping between user to IP address that, uh, by blacklisting a static address that you could actually be blacklisting, you know, 50, 100, 1,000 people. Uh, Lee also mentioned about the DDoS problems. Uh, that's definitely a problem in online gaming, especially peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and then the impacts being even greater uh, with CGNAT in the play. Uh, so it's, it's definitely, it's, it needs to be a collaborative effort. I spend a good amount of my time working with uh, network operators and router manufacturers talking about, you know, helping educate about uh, things with CGNAT like uh, hair pinning support or uh, how to 
uh, configure CGNAT devices to be less problematic for IPv4 peer-to-peer, uh, -peer. Uh, but it's definitely something that uh, we've done and continue to do and will need to continue to do uh, to help uh, educate uh, both uh, game developers as well as network operators about uh, some of the challenges that we're facing and will continue to face at a growing rate uh, because of the V4 uh, address exhaustion problem. So thank you, Dari. So let's start our open microphone session. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Sami Suisi from the French Regulator. It won't be a question, it will be r some kind of remarks. Uh, just to put things in context, uh, I've been always a militant for IPv6. I will explain to you why I'm saying this right now. Uh, in general, I totally agree with Antonio and Barbara. We're on a multi-stakeholder situation, so a co-construction approach is necessary so that we can uh, work together at the same pace and uh, try to accelerate this transition. And that's uh, what we are doing locally at RCEP. That's what we did last month, doing a, a workshop with different uh, stakeholder ISPs, hosting providers, uh, administration, government. We had Europol, ICANN, AFNIC, CC, top the, uh, the TLD in, in France. And we worked together to uh, list the different issues and the different uh, solutions, and we can find some solution that you provided related to training, related to motivate, uh, especially top management to take the risk, even if there is no direct ROI to this implementation. But I may say that I not really agree with you saying that IPv6 provides better quality of service or less latency. Let me uh, explain this. Because for me, we, uh, bef uh, in order to accelerate this transition, we should be critical toward IPv6 and not only say positive things. Uh, first thing related to quality of service, here we took statistics related to Akamai and Google, but internet is not only Akamai or Google that are close to, uh, close to ISPs. If I take the example of tier one, there are issues between Cogent and uh, Hurricane Electrics or Verizon and Deutsche Telekom where they are depearing on IPv6 and it creates quality of service issues. There are other issues related to the fact that uh, we don't uh, uh, peer the same way on IPv4 and IPv6. There is also another issue related to the uh, uh, equipment that uh, root IPv4 hard-coded, but not an IPv6. So we don't have the same SLA regarding IPv6 and IPv4. This is uh, an issue that we should tackle and it would motivate the actor to do so. To come back to the security issue, it's true that uh, we need more training, etc., related to the security of, IP of IPv6, but there is also issues related to the fact that if I take the example of anti dos for IPv6, it's the, there are still solutions that are not mature. So as a militant for IPv6, I think that we should have like a critical vision for what is the actual state of IPv6 so that we can take care of this, uh, not small issues, but if we take them one by one, we can fix them so that uh, we don't like uh, tell things that are not 100% accurate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Hello, um, Jonas Mäkinen. I'm an activist from Electronic Frontier Finland and an enthusiastic Overwatch player. And what I would like to know is that if, is there any kind of um, reliable results so far on how it is to migrate to IPv6 between platforms? Because most definitely if you're playing on Xbox or playing on PlayStation or a Windows desktop, you're going to have to wait a different amount of years for it to work. Is there any sort of uh, current good knowledge on how things are going platform-wise? We already saw something about how it's going with PlayStation, as in no information yet. I, I think part of your question is, is there a list someplace describing how various kinds of devices, uh, what, what their progress is for IPv6 uh, implementation? And if that's the question, the answer is no, because whenever somebody starts to make a list of 
how much IPv6 support devices have, they find that it's impossible to maintain because it changes so fast. Okay, so we don't know how the process of migrating to IPv6 is going on different platforms. Not from a, so not from, elect, not from a consumer electronics platform perspective, I would say. From a general purpose operating system, I'd say it's going spectacularly well. Every major operating system has excellent support for IPv6. In terms of electronics you have in your home that have embedded operating systems, um, probably poorly, but I don't, I don't know of any metrics. I think this, this lack of information is part of the problem. Hello, my name is Gustavo. I am Gustavo Paiva. I am from Brazil's Order of Attorneys. And my question is about how this would relate to eSports. Um, competitive electronic sports are a big business now. And for the athletes involved worldwide, it's a profitable and viable career. And my question is, would this performance drop from the IPv4, IPv4 and IPv6 issue, could this make it unviable for them to participate competitively? Or if not unviable, at least hinder their performance? Let, let me see if I understood the question. You are asking if they, they don't uh, do uh, the, the IPv6 implementation, if in, in some time they, they will suffer for lack of performance, is it? Yeah, my, my point was actually about IPv4, because um, since we've discussed that the IPv4 can bring a few issues, could this maybe end their career, maybe? I mean, I, th isn't that why we're here? Isn't that the concern? Is that, yeah. that, that gamers with IPv6 have an unfair advantage over gamers with IPv4, and that that would be a problem for gamers that only have IPv4? Is that, is that a fair characterization of the problem? Yeah. So sometimes we, we have heard this, that uh, in some games, uh, gamers with IPv6 have an unfair advantage. Uh, and the other part of the problem is that even with IPv6, with ISP offer and IPv6, uh, the gamers don't uh, uh, don't are able to use it because the platform do, does not support IPv6 yet. Yeah. Last comment. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Michael Neal, and I run a posting provider and ISP in Ireland. I mean, just on this thing about trying to push for greater adoption, totally agree with the comments about regulation, but I think government can play a role in encouraging ISPs to roll it out because it's not a, a zero-sum uh, game. I mean, if we, do, we, have, we across Europe have public tenders, and I, I don't see many tenders where the government is saying, you know, we'll give you extra points for IPv6. We'll give you extra points for, you know, something along those lines. I mean, I'm, I know the French government have been doing a lot of work around it, but other, some of the other governments across Europe, you still can't access most of the services over IPv6. So expecting um, the commercial ISPs to take up the banner is probably going to be a hard sell. I mean, and the costs around replacing all of the end user equipment um, is scary. And to the gentleman from Finland about the equipment, uh, the ICANN SAC did a, did a study about nine years ago, but it's completely out of date. It's, nobody updates them on you know, the equipment that supports it. Thanks. I think Darry has something to say. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that there was the, the earlier conversation about uh, eSports and, and the impacts of, of IPv6 access. So I would just say it's incumbent upon uh, platform providers like ourselves with Xbox to uh, help educate the customer as far as uh, not only do they have uh, v6 connectivity, but also what is the quality of that connectivity. Uh, the gaming population is, is uh, so attuned to what the quality of their connection is, uh, is that it actually can be a forcing function uh, that 
uh, customers that can see that they have a, a better quality connection with one ISP versus another with IPv6, that it can actually help uh, as far as being used as a competitive advantage and help justify further investments in IPv6. So uh, it's something that we've been looking at that we need to spend some more time in, in investing in to actually help show customers that not only do you have v6 connectivity, but here's your throughput and latency uh, for v6 versus v4. Uh, and through that, it's not uncommon to see some word of mouth of, hey, my, my friend has 30 milliseconds latency less than I do on this other ISP. Uh, I'm going to go take a look and see what that looks like, and it can help uh, build some critical mass behind adoption and, and, and high quality v6 connectivity. So that's it. Thank you all for coming. Game over. Game over, PV4. Ha, 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 ha.